Okay, so good afternoon, friends. Thank you all for being here. We are going to get started on our next panel, and I'm particularly excited about this panel. Um, so quickly again, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the third iteration of the Gulf Coast Connections Conference. I want to begin by giving a heartfelt thank you to Joe and Weston for this magnificent brainchild of Gulf Coast Connections Conferences and for inviting us to be a part of this for the first two iterations at Rice University and then inviting us to be a part of the third iteration here at Tulane. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Wes. Oh, in the back. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Um, secondly, thanks to Rebecca Snedeker and the excellent staff, staff at New Orleans Center for the Gulf South for all of the hard work coordinating the conference. Um, I also want to say thanks to Nathaniel Rich and Ryan McBride, who have been our co-conspirators about the Tulane iteration of the Gulf Coast Connections Conference. So thanks to that. And then um, to move into the panel today, we are having a discussion about climate change across the disciplines. And we have three excellent panelists, which will leave us plenty of time for a collective discussion, which I really look forward to. Um, first, we have Dan Fries, who is a Cochrane Family Professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences at Tulane University. Um, he is an interdisciplinary coastal science who is interested in human environment interactions with mangroves and seagrasses. We will then have Yusho Sai and Simone Demang. I'm sorry, Simone Demang. Okay, there we go. Um, Yusho is a research associate professor at Tulane's Bywater Institute with formal training in civil and environmental engineering and a specialization in hydrology. Simone is also a research associate professor. You can just do your hand wave. Um, at the Tulane Bywater Institute, she is an environmental sociologist and critical scholar of climate adaptation and disaster resilience. And then we have Anna Ochoa, who is the department chair and professor in music at Tulane University. Her work is on histories of listening and the decolonial and exploring the relationship between sound, climate change, and the colonial. So just in terms of process, we have invited each speaker to come up and talk for about 10 minutes about their work, their current thinking on these topics. And then we will invite all of us to be on stage with myself and um, we will have a collective discussion. I forgot to introduce myself. I am Laura McKinney. I am out of breath because I just got here from another meeting. I am an associate professor of sociology and the director of environmental studies and the director of urban studies here at Tulane University. Thank you, Dan, you're first up. Uh, so I've actually set a stopwatch because I cannot talk about mangroves for just 10 minutes. I will be here for hours, so please start waving at me um, if I go too far over time. This is actually, this is a mangrove forest. This is actually the second mangrove forest you've seen this afternoon. Um, if you remember back to Casey's uh, presentation with the books, um, one of them was The Great Derangement uh, by Amitav Ghosh. The background to that book, that blue color palette, uh, is the Sundarbans mangrove forest uh, on the border of India and Bangladesh. And, and it's, it's used in a lot of uh, his work because it's, it's emblematic of the front lines of climate change. There are 4.5 million people living within that mangrove ecosystem. And that, that Sundarban system is a great example of how mangroves are a key social ecological system. And I guess my, my work has ended up around this kind of diagram. Um, I'm glad I found this diagram because at first I thought my work was just random uh, and things that I was interested in. And the social ecological system, apart from being a fantastic concept, is also a good heuristic to actually you know, make it sound like I'm doing something coherent. But I, I started, you know, I'm, I'm a geographer uh, from the Earth Environmental Sciences uh, Department here. And I guess I started maybe on the outskirts of this diagram on the ecosystem structure and the processes and functions part. But over time, 
I've realized that working in these systems, that work doesn't mean anything if it's not connected to the people uh, who are living in these working landscapes. So a lot of my work is really now looking at how ecosystems benefit people um, and how people impact positively and negatively uh, the resilience of the mangrove forest. And then of course, throw climate change on top of that as well. And one reason why they are a, an important social ecological system is because of these goods and benefits uh, that they provide. And here are a few examples of coastal protection, fisheries, uh, a number of commercial fish species spend at least a part of their life cycle in a mangrove forest, uh, the juvenile stage. We extract a lot of resources, fuel, medicinal products, etc., and a lot of ecotourism activities and, and other things. Uh, but while we're interested in all of these ecosystem services, I'm just gonna focus on one, and it's this one at the bottom of carbon storage, or using ecosystems to help uh, mitigate global climate change and to draw down uh, some of the carbon from the atmosphere uh, through what we would call natural climate solutions. Now, these are not a, a get out of jail free card for the hard job of decarbonization, but for those emissions that maybe we can't um, draw down too much, we can maybe offset using uh, these natural systems. So mangroves and other wetlands are, are known as these uh, as the nature's superheroes in the fight against climate change, uh, in part because they're able to take carbon from the atmosphere and store it at really high densities. Uh, they have these waterlogged soils, and the carbon doesn't get broken down and put back to the atmosphere, but it gets accumulated in the wetland soils over thousands of years. Um, so this graph here shows the amount of carbon in lots of different ecosystems, and the mangroves are storing twice as much carbon per hectare as other types of ecosystems. So there, you know, you get a lot of bang for your buck. You don't need a huge amount of area to, to be able to store a lot of carbon. You know, and a lot of my work started by going out, digging holes in mangroves, measuring carbon, measuring trees, climbing trees, and all this kind of stuff, uh, making these kind of graphs. But you know, they, are, they provide all these great benefits, and yet the irony is um, they're a heavily threatened ecosystem across much of their range in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, this map uh, on the side is uh, from Southeast Asia, which is the hotspot of global mangrove loss and where most of my research uh, has been based. Uh, and it shows the different types of human land use drivers uh, that are causing the loss of mangrove forests. Uh, to rates of that we thought we were losing them at 3% per year. And this, these are rates that are faster than the loss of coral reefs, of rainforests, uh, and they were considered one of the most threatened habitats on the planet. Now we have good news that that's kind of turned around and they're still being lost, but at almost a, a rate that's an order of magnitude lower than it used to be. Um, but we're still getting primarily human commodity production driving a lot of this loss. So we're extracting benefits from uh, these ecosystems, but of course our human and coastal uh, land use decisions are themselves impacting them. And uh, I thought I'd throw the uh, mangroves of the Gulf of Mexico uh, in, in this little uh, map at the, at the, at the bottom. Uh, we're actually undergoing a process at the moment um, by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, they have a red list of ecosystems process. So you might have heard the red list of species, uh, particular species are critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable. Uh, the IUCN is now doing the same assessment for ecosystems. Uh, and we've done this for mangroves of Southeast Asia. We're now doing it for mangroves of the Gulf of Mexico. Which, and this mangroves here are an interesting example because at the moment they're actually expanding in area because of climate change. As air temperatures warm, mangroves are able to move northwards uh, with, move, with uh, warming air temperatures. So at the moment, we would not consider them th threatened at all. Over the next 50 to 100 years though, climate change and sea level rise in particular is gonna outweigh any potential benefit of, of increasing air temperatures. And we actually consider mangroves in the Gulf of Mexico to be critically endangered by the end of this century. Um, so this is uh, analyses that uh, are ongoing with the IUCN right now. But I pose this kind of question uh, at the bottom here. If we know all of these benefits and we know that people 
rely on mangroves, can we use these benefits to incentivize protecting them and restoring them? And this is uh, what a lot of our work has focused on in the last few years. And one way to do this, and this is a very problematic way of doing it, and there are many issues with selling carbon credits in the monetization of nature, but one way that's got a lot of uh, interest from governments and, and corporate sectors is uh, Basically, if we can stop that mangrove being cut down, any carbon that we have stopped from going into the atmosphere, we can, you know, we can monetize that and, and use that as, you know, keep that carbon locked in the ground. Somebody will pay for it to stay locked in the ground, maybe as part of their offsets or something. Um, and then that mangrove will continue providing all of the benefits uh, that it's providing beyond just carbon. Um, and we've had the double effect of not putting those emissions into the atmosphere. Um, so there's a huge amount of interest in using mangroves and other coastal or blue carbon systems uh, in this way. Um, and this map just shows where those projects might be able to happen. Um, basically, it's a, it's a balance between how much uh, carbon is being lost and how much mangrove is being lost. Um, how much that would be worth on a carbon market. And that tells you how much money that project would generate versus how much it actually costs to do that project, right? Um, and wherever those numbers, uh, wherever projects fall on, the, on that balance, they would either be um, non-investable, it's just not worth doing a carbon credit project there. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do lots of other different things there uh, to, for, to, for management. Um, there might be ones that are investable and they break even, or there might be ones that are profitable um, and actually would generate more uh, finance than they cost. So that is more finance and money for conservation and restoration. And hopefully, depending um, if these are high integrity projects, that is money that would ultimately flow to the communities living in those landscapes who are being asked to change their management. And actually, 20% of the world's mangroves would qualify for this kind of project, which is a bad statistic because it means 20% of the world's mangroves are threatened, um, but would be suitable for this. And it would generate uh, over a billion US dollars of conservation finance every year um, if we could do projects in all of these locations, right? So, of course, now we're starting to talk about some big money, right? So a lot of people get interested in this. When The Economist magazine is writing about carbon and conservation of mangroves, that's an interesting audience that hasn't normally talked about that before, right? So these are just some examples of, of, of the interest in using these kind of mechanisms. And, and we've been part of this, you know, part of our work has been to, to try and communicate with different sectors, whether it's national governments um, or the business community, about what the potential is and how they can get involved in these projects in a way which is um, which produces high quality conservation outcomes. Um, so what I mean by that is it doesn't kick communities off the land, it isn't greenwashing, um, but it's done in a principled uh, way with integrity. So despite all of that interest, all of these huge sums of money that are being waved around, um, this is how many projects there are in the world. So a lot of businesses will say, okay, you've said about how great this is. I want to give you some money. I want to protect a mangrove forest tomorrow. Please take my money. And I say, well, sorry, I haven't really got anywhere to put your money yet because we only really have a handful of these projects that have worked. Um, you know, some, the, the first one was a community project in Mikoka Pomoja in Kenya. Um, they're starting to increase in scale. But, and every time I give this, I show this slide, I add another bubble, which is good, but I'm not adding 100 bubbles to this map. So we're not meeting this potential. And so my question has always been, well, why, right? If this is so great, and I would, you know, and we have all these big numbers, well, there's a couple of reasons. Those maps and models earlier could be completely wrong, uh, and that is not out of the question. Um, but actually, those maps are really showing kind of the physical potential, um, but then the rubber hits the road, right? And all of a sudden, actually implementing these kind of projects um, is hitting some major roadblocks. Uh, and those roadblocks are not physical, 
they're not ecological. They are purely social and governance related. They're about land tenure. They're about equitable benefit sharing. They're about who owns the carbon and who has the rights to carbon and, and questions like this. And then even if somebody does sort all of that out and wants to do a project, say you want to restore mangroves uh, for carbon credits or for any other benefit, um, this is what happens. Um, can you see any mangroves in this slide? This is a five-year-old mangrove restoration project. Uh, and it's not a trick question. There are, no, they, there are mangroves in there. They're just all dead. Um, so we have this huge issue where there's lots of interest in restoring mangroves, but this, and we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing it, and this is the outcome. And this is a it's pretty typical outcome. Now, there's a bunch of reasons for this. Why, why do plants die? Because you plant them in the wrong place, right? They can't survive in those particular conditions. That's an ecological factor and a, and a natural science factor, right? Um, now, why do people plant mangroves in places they shouldn't? Um, it's not because they don't know where mangroves should go, um, but there are a bunch of social governance and political barriers that force people to plant in those areas. If the area that would be best to plant a mangrove is already owned by somebody, um, that, and they're using it for shrimp aquaculture, they're not just going to give up that shrimp pond and let you plant mangroves in it, right? Um, you may not even know who owns that shrimp pond um, because of competing and overlapping land tenure claims. Um, so it's not that people don't, you know, that we don't know how to grow these things, but there are so many barriers that force us then instead, well, okay, we want to do at least something, so let's plant them here because this is a, a nice mud flat that nobody owns. Uh, nobody's um, going to complain if I plant mangroves on there. But it's a mud flat for a reason, um, because trees can't grow there, right? Um, so we, these projects get pushed into these marginal landscapes um, because of this whole host of, of um, community level all the way to state actor level constraints. So mangroves to me have been just a great example of how, you know, if I come in with a purely natural science lens, I can tell everybody how to do mangrove restoration, but it's pointless um, because that is only half of the question. In fact, it's less than half of the question. And the majority of that question and, and getting, and where we have had projects that have worked really well, have been a predominantly social and community-based projects. Um, without really a lot of ecological input from, from our side. Um, and these things take time, right? So we've worked with a lot of restoration NGOs um, in Southeast Asia to implement these projects. And then I thought, well, as, you know, it's all very well and good and academic going in and telling somebody how to do something, right? But we should try and do it ourselves as well. So we actually set up our own community-based uh, mangrove restoration project it's like, it's less than 10 acres. It is tiny on the grand scale of things. It has been 10 years of community work, negotiation with government agencies, and only this year will the first mangroves grow in the, go in the ground. So if it takes 10 years for 10 acres, and, we, and some countries have ambitions to restore up to a million acres just in Indonesia um, in the next couple of years, you know, these social governance uh, barriers are, gonna, are really constraining the speed and the scale at which we can do this. Um, thanks. Uh, so that's my bit about mangroves. I know I'm slightly over time, but I will just a quick plug as well. Um, I'm involved in the journal Why is Climate Change? Um, and I, since I have an audience of people who are very interested in climate change, this is not a natural science journal. In fact, its aim is to deprivilege the natural sciences and bring in humanities and social sciences. So if you have any interest in publishing reviews, uh, commentaries, perspectives, please come speak to me and we would love uh, your contributions. All right, thank you. Sorry for going over time. So I am a research um, research assistant professor at the Bywater Institute. Um, I just started in July, so it's really great to meet some more folks at Tulane. Um, and I am a sociologist is my home discipline. 
and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bottle Water Institute and just I'll touch up really shortly on some of my research and some interests. Um, and then Yusho is going to talk a little bit about her research as well. So I just wanted to start by saying that I feel like I'm kind of wearing two hats when I talk about social science research um, or climate change, uh, transdisciplinary research, um, however you want to phrase it, and my research areas. Because you know, on the one hand, I am I, I work for the Bywater Institute, and this is an institute that is all about convening folks from across disciplines to uh, collaborate on more convergent types of research. Um, so that's sort of the latest uh, phrase going from research used to be thought of as, you know, being involving different disciplines as being interdisciplinary, but then that really was just kind of superficially putting people together. So then it became transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and now convergent research is the new goal um, to really convey a deep integration of different disciplines and methods and tools to solve big problems. Um, and so this is, it, it's an interesting topic. And as a social scientist, sometimes it's like you kind of want to put your social scientific lens up to it and say like, what is this process and kind of interrogate it from that standpoint. So I just wanted to start by saying that, um, but to say a little bit more, about uh, the Bywater Institute. Our vision is, um, we like to say, to thrive by water. We start with an overarching vision um, for a New Orleans, Coastal Louisiana, and Mississippi River Basin where thriving by water is available to everyone. Um, and we do work, like I said, basically in this area of convergent research, um, solutions driven um, research on issues basically at the intersection of climate and water. We also have this really wonderful program called Studio in the Woods. Um, there's resident ret retreats um, for faculty at Tulane. Um, they host artists um, with a strong emphasis on indigenous and people of color artists. Um, and also, um, you know, really put on a lot of events that are all about being inspired by nature, you know, kind of just being enmeshed, surrounded by nature and honoring um, that place and kind of thinking about the connections between the ecological and the natural, spiritual, you know, all of these different areas. Um, we do some science communication work and science communication programming. Um, we also are engaging stakeholders in the public in dialogue and education about climate change and other water-related environmental topics. And we also do a lot of work in the area of early faculty development. We have Bywater faculty fellows um, and uh, have working groups and um, try and support faculty um, as they pursue grant work, um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary convergent work, et cetera. Uh, just to give uh, an example, and yeah, sorry, uh, part of the word resilience is cut off, but this was an example of the latest proposal that I put together. So this was for uh, the NOAA Climate Resilience Regional Challenge for a climate resilience planning grant. And so for this, Tulane is really a facilitator because um, the project really came to us um, because community members, local governments, planning commissions um, saw a need for more increased collaboration between Southwest Louisiana, which has just been bombarded by hurricanes and disasters, um, and also the Central Acadiana region, which has um, the Atchafalaya Basin, um, and there was a need for more collaboration between governmental partners. There's also a lot of environmental um, and climate justice issues um, in this region, particularly around Calcasieu Parish, it's um, heavily industrialized. Um, and so we wanted to bring together a group of folks that would um, together define 
uh, vision for what resilience looks like. Um, and the term resilience is really uh, deeply frustrating for a lot of people, but that's what Noah wants to use, so he used it. But um, you know, recognizing that people are surviving um, and have many, many capacities, but are facing very great challenges. And so um, you know, we're, we're trying to arm them with some of the uh, technical capacities that might help in their endeavors to plan for um, the climate future. So we're also specifically looking at some uh, hydrology issues. And um, another important point of this is we are doing extensive outreach right now with the different tribal governments. Um, but, you know, also this is a learning experience for us in terms of engaging with tribal nations as sovereign nations and ensuring that they participate in the project on their own terms um, and that we have all of the necessary agreements to protect um, tribal sovereignty and knowledge. So that's an example of the type of project that I'm involved in the Firewater. Um, just to give kind of a, a really brief synopsis of what I'm interested in, I'm interested in these questions of adaptation and resilience um, and how that is translated into projects and planning efforts and how that relates to inequality in terms of how does it reflect, address, and in some cases, I argue, reproduce social inequalities. Um, so some of the ways you can think about the potential for that happening would be looking at what um, justice scholars term these different categories of justice or equity. So um, this is pretty simplified. There's many different ways that scholars have um, theorized the relationship between distributive equity, procedural equity, and recognitional equity, or use different terms. Um, but basically to say that distributive equity or justice comes from this Rawlsian theory of justice that's really about the distribution materially of goods and, um, and risks or harms. Um, procedural equity, which usually focuses more on process and how institutional political processes um, can be biased or favor privileged groups. And then recognitional equity that addresses more issues of status and acceptance. Um, so some examples of the way in which you might see adaptation or uh, resilience actually um, being instances of inequities might be something like flood protection that is prioritized in white affluent areas, um, green projects leading to gentrification, or procedural equity, thinking about the way in which participatory planning processes um, favor people with time and resources. Um, there's a reliance on Western ways of knowing. Um, some procedures um, and planning efforts may misuse or appropriate local indigenous knowledge. Um, and then in terms of recognitional equity, um, might think about this in the ways that um, the really deep histories of inequality may be flattened, um, histories of settler colonialism, redlining, etc. And I could talk a little bit more about some specific examples um, from my research, but I wanted to talk about two um, emerging topics that I think are really interesting from a social scientific standpoint in terms of the field of climate adaptation and climate adaptation planning. And there's a real trend right now um, in this topic of co-production. And so I, I actually did not know this, but um, right, uh, co-production is a term that sort of, I think, developed in sort of parallel tracks in social um, uh, science and technology studies, or STS and also public administration. And so the co-production in science and technology studies was really um, kind of looking at the processes in which knowledge is produced. Um, and then in public administration, it was also about the way that um, 
local citizens created governance processes or created, co-created um, certain types of public services. And right now, there's a real boom towards the idea of co-production and climate adaptation that knowledge about climate or, or maybe even not climate per se, but environmental sustainability, other environmental topics needs to be um, made in um, interactively with the people on the ground, um, with local stakeholders. And a lot of times um, people think of that as being folks in local government, people in agencies. Um, sometimes people mean, mean it um, more as people in the grassroots community level. So that's, that's a new trend. And there are lots of funders that are asking for co-production as part of the scientific process. And the idea is that this knowledge that is co-produced is more actionable and it's more usable because it's uh, responsive to the individual context in which it is produced. Um, but it also raises lots of really interesting questions because um, you know, funders are asking for co-production with a community, but it raises questions about who is the community and how does this relate to um, the knowledge at hand, the tools that are produced, um, the, the intended use of these tools. So an example here is some work done by the Great Lakes Integrated Science Assessment Team. They got together a lot of stormwater system practitioners and local government staff um, and drainage departments um, and public works departments. And they co-produced this uh, climate vulnerability assessment with climatologists and experts at uh, GLISA, this um, sort of research center at the University of Michigan. And um, they, we, they, I was a part of a project where we took this vulnerability assessment and applied it to a different context, to the two communities in the Gulf Coast. And what we found though, um, you know, there was some, some ways in which, going back to these ideas about justice and equity, that engaging with folks, um, with, with staff, we realized that they don't always have the best understanding of who is in their community at that granular level. And they say, well, we hear you know, from specific people all the time. And a lot of times those are the more privileged members of their community. Um, we found some instances where there was a real reluctance to engage in conversation about historical redlining, uh, about people of color, or about um, you know seeing people that are traditionally thought of as socially vulnerable also as people with capacities um, that may also understand uh, even better like the the community that they are in. So because of this, you know, we thought a lot about the way we termed the communities that we're working in. Because on one level, we're talking about co-producing knowledge with frontline community members and or frontline communities. And so that made us, um, you know, or some folks on the team think really hard about what does it mean to say you work with or engage frontline communities when we're working with a particular um, person situated in a particular institution. So because of this, we um, got some funding to do this work again, um, this time really working very closely with community-based organizations um, to look more in depth about some of these equity and justice considerations, uh, and then also looking at how we can bring that together with the uh, more local government folks so that the knowledge, or so that the outcomes with the community is also um, something that can be actionable um, at that level. And then I want to talk a little bit about another emerging topic. And um, I, you know, I, I think this speaks to a few of the things that Dan mentioned, um, sort of, in, in his talk. But you know, there's there's a real push right now for large scale adaptation mitigation restoration projects and um, there I think sometimes is um, a way in which the 
potential negative externalities are um, wiped away from those projects. And um, one example in my research um, has to do with the sediment diversions that are being built in the lower Mississippi region. And um, I, I don't want to come at this as critiquing the projects and the science because um, I, what I really did in my research, though, was to show that the way in which um, institutional actors and often scientists and their components um, framed the projects um, in ways that really did not align with the views of um, particularly um, Southeast Asian fishing communities, um, with some of the communities, indigenous communities, um, people of color communities, who felt like they would be negatively impacted by the projects. And, um, you know, the, the, the line that a lot of folks from state agencies would say is that we understand, you know, these concerns, but there's this bigger picture. And so there's this idea of a greater good, and there's an idea that sacrifices have to be made on these local levels in order to meet this greater good. And I, I hear the same discourse um, repeated oftentimes when thinking about other large scale projects that, you know, are really framed as extremely necessary from a climate perspective. So, um, you know, thinking about the amount of land that it's going to take to have um, solar build out, wind build out, if you're thinking about carbon sequestration, carbon capture projects, etc. cetera. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of an interesting tension. Um, also thinking about how, for example, the environmental movement for a very long time um, really used the legal system in order to oppose projects. And there is a way in which um, now even people in the climate justice movement are um, really wanting to speed up and accelerate, for example, like environmental impact, the, the NEPA process, et cetera, to really like um, speed up the build out of this type of infrastructure. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's really a place for us to have a conversation about how we do that in a way, uh, you know, that, that centers the people that have historically been considered sacrificial communities. Um, and it really makes you interrogate what is this bigger picture and who, uh, like, who is that bigger picture for and who gets to frame that bigger picture. And I just want to end by saying that, you know, a lot of the folks that I talk to in the community um, really want to flip this on their head to say that, you know, we want to be part of the solution. And because we have experienced, you know, a legacy and a history of trauma in our communities, we understand what it means to be resilient. Um, and so we can be part of the solution, but that means really including us as, as equal partners and not writing us off as sacrificial people. Um, so I, that is, I think, a really important emergent, emerging topic in climate change and social science. And I'll get to that. I think that's it for me. So here I'm just like following up uh, on what Simone was talking about, the by water. And um, so today, uh, Laura specifically asked about the climate change impact and adaptation. And I was thinking, well, our group uh, do a lot of climate change impact assessments. And then we are just trying to get into the territories of uh, adaptation by like focus on uh, solution oriented kind of research. And uh, I hope that, uh, so I can talk uh, a lot about, oh, what we want to do about adaptation, but I can offer a lot what we have uh, done in the past about uh, climate change impact assessments. So I'm here specifically want to talk about two of the watersheds that the Bight Water has been uh, researching in the past like a uh, couple of years. We have a team 
And the first uh, water share that I'm going to talk about, which I'm like, really exciting about this water share. And every time I talk about it, I cannot stop. So you just have to stop me if I time runs out. And so that watershed is Mekong River watershed in Southeast Asia. And uh, it was a watershed that the river flows, of, uh, flows uh, across five different nations. And uh, the first one, it, uh, the, the headwater uh, starts from China and then goes to, if I, co if I remember correctly, Myanmar and then Laos and then uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And so uh, the upstream countries, especially China and Laos, and they, they want to push this narrative as like building dams to, uh, to like generate clean energy. And, and so there's uh, a dam building like, uh, like, going on and like in past 10 years, they probably built like uh, 20 dams or even more, maybe 50, like a series of dams like blocking the Mekong River. So, so the Mekong, the uh, river has a uh, 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 um, uh, high flow season and there's a low flow season. So there's a really nice natural flood, uh, uh, flood pose, we call it. And that flood pose is going to allow the fish in Mekong to thrive and to produce and you know, uh, to whatever that's their ecosystem. But with the dams that that 50, 20, that 20, 50 dams building, the, uh, the natural pose uh, was kind of moderate. It used to be like really this thing that you can see the curve, and now it's like really moderate. And then that mother, uh, modified flood pose kind of uh, affect the fish populations. And so the fish harvesting has been decreased like, over the past 10 or 20 years. And it's more like, uh, you can see the decrease like, in most recent years much more. And, and so my, so this is Mekong uh, River Basin. And that is uh, where the local people, how they fish uh, there. Uh, with this like, you know, different kinds of the fishing tools. And this is one of them that is spe uh, specifically like, uh, like fantastic to me. <laughs> uh, so, so my research comes in that my recent interest uh, about Mekong River is about the fish. So there's a decrease in the fish population and harvest. And how does that impact um, the local people, especially uh, the people in Cambodia, that uh, their main uh, like, uh, diet is like the fish is one of the, the, the uh, primary protein that they consume like uh, in their culture. And so that decrease in the fish harvest does have a significant impact um, their, uh, the, the people's uh, nutrition. And so my interest, my research interest comes in by, okay, so there is a decrease in pop, uh, fish population. And how does that impact um, the people's uh, fish consumption habits? Because uh, the Nikon rivers has about probably 100 different kinds of fish species. And with the flood pose change, some of the fish species is going to die out, and some of the fish species was like, oh, that's our opportunities. That's really that we prefer like the modern modified like flood pose. And so uh, the major like uh, fish species that were harvested and uh, consumed in the local communities 
they are uh, uh, there's a, a significant decrease, but but there's some fish species they there's an increase in populations. So that has a great impact on uh, the uh, local people's uh, consumption patterns, and that consumption patterns is going to affect their nutrition. So that's where my research comes in about how because the, uh, the climate change and the dam building uh, has changed the uh, hydrologic uh, regimes in the river and and that has an impact uh, on fish and then on people's consumption and their nutrition. And so what's the solution? So the solution is that, well, there are so many dams. So what if the dams were built by uh, different countries? So there's a really ambitious goal if the dam operators of each dams can cooperate in a way to kind of change the flow regime so that the flow regime would uh, return to have more distinct by high flow and low flow. And so that might help um, the fish, uh, you know, that might uh, create a beneficial economy uh, ecosystems for fish, but then that requires the dam operators to cooperate. And but uh, a lot of um, the researchers, we we would we would be talking about okay, we want to optimize uh, the dam operations, and that we. We were kind of research on paper that, oh, it's out to be this dam should operate this way. And the, the dam, like, uh, um, like, uh, uh, like, further away should operate the other way. But the most important thing is how do we get people to cooperate? And that's the very difficult thing. So, so, uh, so it would be involve the decisions about so what are the priorities for each uh, sector so do people care most about the fish harvest or do people care about the rice production so in addition to the fish uh, harvest the rice production using the river from Mekong to produce rice is also really important too so there's a competing use for water. And, and also there's, of course, the dam operators, they want to um, use the water to create uh, energy, clean energy. So those were the competing uh, the use for water and who has the priorities? And who got to say, my, priority, my priorities is more important than yours. And so that, those that that kind of um, that who decides what are the priorities and who gets what and how much and that's the critical question and so people were there are a lot of researchers are using optimization to allocate the source the resources to come up the optimum by outputs but then uh, the optimum output is when everyone cooperates what if this i mean it's the ideal situation it's rare to see everyone cooperate especially in multiple countries right or five countries if you including china and so we can only arrive sub optimization so that's where everyone is for himself. But that is still a solution. And I want, just want to say this, and so everybody can take this and think about uh, the solution. So next one, I want to talk about the lower uh, grassroots facing in Texas, U um, USA. And that's another um, 
uh, watershed that by water has a project, uh, has several projects in this uh, watershed. So this watershed has um, floods somewhere and has like has droughts. Um, so it, it was like imbalance. It's not always have floods all the time. It just has seasonal floods at some of the places, and it has a, a seasonal droughts in some of the places, especially the lower basins. And uh, if you look at the map, this is, by the way, this is the, the whole um, Brazos River watershed. And uh, I probably didn't include the map, sorry. Uh, so here, here's a land, land, uh, land use map of the Texas. And the, the neon blue outline is kind of the uh, part of the Brazos River watershed. And um, And so for, for this, uh, we have studies to, uh, in this region, to study what are the impacts of uh, climate um, the, uh, on the uh, flows in the rivers, and, and then uh, the adaptation piece is the uh, solution is that uh, we kind of investigate throughout the whole watershed. It's hard to see that you can see this like little red dots uh, all over like throughout the watershed and each dot representing uh, uh, a potential wetland site. And this potential wetland site, the smallest is uh, around uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers and uh, the bigger one is uh, roughly about 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. And so uh, our researchers uh, uh, investigate the whole watershed and then pick uh, about, I think those were about 120 something uh, wetland potential size. And those in the red dots that you can see are uh, the top 50, uh, wetland sites that have good potential to reduce flood heat. That means if all those like, uh, so what it means in one of our research shows that among those 50 potential wetland sites, if we choose one of them to restore, then, then you can uh, reduce the flood peak by this much, but if we choose five, we can reduce flood peak by that much. And eventually, uh, you can see the flood peak reduction, it kind of increased pretty uh, steep, like uh, around uh, from one to 30, and then it kind of went tall at the end. And that's how much effort needed to put in in order to reduce the flood peak. And is it doable by thinking about if we want to uh, restore, say like 25 of the wetlands across the uh, watershed and some selected areas. So we have to think about whether the landowners of the areas would like the ideas, right? And then uh, we have to think about the uh, land acquisition costs. And then we have to think about other issues that we talk, we talk with some of the landowners and some of the landowners, they were saying, no, no, no. If you create the wetland here, it's going to bring a lot of mosquitoes. We don't like that. So there are several, many, many different issues that has to, you know, we have to negotiate with like all the uh, effective by stakeholders in order to achieve uh, our goal, which is reduce what heat. And that's how difficult it is to actually implement 
adaptation strategies to really have your strategy uh, creating a meaningful impact. That's my message here today. So do we, we still have all the projects that I can talk about. If you are interested, please feel free to, you know, I would love to chat with you. And this is just some of the flavors of one of the two major research we have. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>
educate people on forming new relationships with land. I guess that's the part that was uh, a little unclear. Uh, I'm a historian, so all my people are dead. So <laughs> they're really going to ask a lot of questions. I'm really interested in this idea. Yeah, um, well, I think that was a really um, great way to term those relationships. Um, and I would say it's like a both and. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of the Bywater Institute is really to be a hub at Tulane for folks that are interested in climate and water um, related challenges. Um, but we have this kind of unique, uh, or, or not but, but um, there's also in addition to that, this really unique program that is also a part of my water called Studio in the Woods. And so that's where the more um, kind of humanities and arts also is integrated into that um, idea. But really, like it's very open-ended in terms of we're just trying to um, generate ideas. Um, a lot of the work is kind of centered around these really big grant um, opportunities that come up, and there's there's a lot of them now. Um, but I, I definitely think that if anyone is interested, no matter what the perspective and discipline is, um, yeah, there, there's there's probably a way to be integrated into the institution. Um, I don't know. Are you from? Are you at Tulane or? No. Okay. Oh well. In any way, like I mean, um, there's there's definitely ways where you can still be connected, but. Um, yeah, I, I think it is it is a really good question about history in terms of how that is really integrated though into considerations of where our future is going to be. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, interested to hear more when you talked about making films with roots in South America or the Caribbean, right? You talk about the way of making is inherently different, right? So you'll hear a sound all linked up and performing if it's a written kind of ritual. Obviously, those ways of making are going to be inscribed in the cultural products that are made. What are the ways you're seeing that being inscribed? And or are you writing about this as well? Or like how how do you see those then also to see like the ways of making? So first of all, there's a huge um, community of filmmakers in Latin America, of indigenous filmmakers that have been organizing as a group. Uh, there is a collective since 1985. There's annual uh, indigenous film festivals that are Latin America wide. There's annual nation specific indigenous film festivals and there's other transnational indigenous film festivals such as the Mother Tongue Film Festival of the Smithsonian which just finished. Um, so I just want to make say that because I don't think I'm able to generalize. That said, uh, where we work there are on the one hand, many discussions about production. Those discussions about production have to do with, for example, the idea that the land is straight sacred, that there are beings, mythical beings living on it, and whether, um, whether they want to show it to the outside or not. Uh, so that's one problematic, which we are now working with a lawyer that works with digital rights because of course, satellite is filming all that. <laughs> So how does this question, um, you know, relate to that, let's say, um, you know, new forms of digital appropriation of images of land? Um, so we're in the midst, because there's extensive, extensive discussions. Where can we film? Where can we not film? Other, the, the other, the second element is that there's been a lot of filmmaking within the communities for the communities. So for example, the teaching of indigenous languages in schools is, uh, has been authorized in Latin America since the 1980s. Um, and so there was an early phase of filmmaking for materials for those schools. They were not for the outside. Today, those films are for the outside. They want to be heard and they want to be seen and they want us to know that they exist. When I teach my course on contemporary indigenous thought or indigenous film and sound, 
the first thing that you go through is the fact that no one has spoken to an indigenous person when you begin that film. So that's, it's or that they're contemporary people. So it's extremely powerful um, to, to, for example, speak to a Mayan rapper who, who's a climate activist, so that type of thing. So um, the other type of form, so that gets inscribed in the film in very different ways. What gets chosen, what not gets chosen, the work of the community I work with also makes sure that it's not a documentary. So the way to make sure, that, what is it? Um, is they do a series of processes. For example, there's a seven day discussion about what part to film, what not to film, how to take, to, how to tell us, our, their little brothers, that's what we think, uh, we're called, uh, what they're going through. So that discussion is summarized into a scene that is acted out in an improvisational way so that it appears in the film, for example. That's one form. Uh, the other is, um, uh, the use of natural light, where we work, there's no use of artificial light. Well, there's no electricity in the Seba anyway, but uh, it's, a, it's a purposeful uh, decision. Um, and sometimes you think that the decisions have to do with our ways of thinking about things. So I remember there, and the, the, during a tour process, just one more thing, and I'm going to shut up. Uh, there was a change in the film between black and white images and color images. So somebody in a presentation at Columbia University asked why, and they said, because during mythical times, there was no light. So I would have never imagined, even having worked on that whole production for months, that that would have been the answer. So these other answers emerge also um, as you get to know them more. So anyway, thank you for the question. Yes. Yeah, I've got a question about your work on the Brazos. I, my Texas geography is terrible, but um, but what is the impact of the, you know, we've seen a huge expansion of oil and gas production in Texas in the last decade or so, and I believe the Eagle Ford cuts across the Brazos and the Permian isn't all that far away. What's the impact of the of production in the Eagle Ford or, or, or the Permian on, um, on water use or uh, in Texas? In the well, um, that's a good question. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, so we didn't specifically study uh, the oil industry in Texas, but when we uh, try to survey uh, potential wetland sites, we do see uh, on the satellite image that there are some particular sites that we think would be good to be restored to wetland. And we can see this wide little patches. And it seems that it's the, um, the, the oil and gas uh, reserve. Uh, so that means that uh, this piece of the land is off limits and you probably cannot even like, uh, would have enough money to acquire the land to, uh, to restore the land to wetland because I mean, uh, it's more uh, profitable uh, to have the land used for, uh, for the purpose of uh, the gas and oil industry. And, and there are um, several, I would say that um, a fair among uh, the sites were like that, but, um, but at this point, we didn't go too deep into that, uh, but that's a really good um, uh, reminder to really uh, also include uh, what the impact of the, the oil and gas industry in Texas. I don't know if I answered uh, your question, but I would be happy to talk more about that, uh, like to, to hear your ideas and uh, maybe it would be, I would be happy to, yes. Well, and with that, I think we're going to end almost on time and can we get a big round of applause for our panelists.